Hello, everybody. My name is Arjun Dev Arora, and I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Format One. We support funds and LPs and founders and help them accelerate their efforts via people, strategy, and capital. And now off to John. Hi, uh, John Lu here, co-founder and partner at uh, Format One, uh, particularly specialized in focusing on supporting uh, early, early growth stage founders. But more about us on our website. Today, we have like a wonderful guest. His name's Human. Radbar and um, Human, um, why don't you introduce yourself? What are you up to now? And what are you doing? Hey, John, Arjun, thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Human. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the co founder and CEO of Collective, and we are the first online back office designed for Business of One. So, freelancers, consultants, um, anyone who hangs up a shingle, we're here to serve. Wow. And um, so how, how did you uh, come across this idea that became a company that became a rapidly growing company, Human? Uh, it's a good question. So I think it's been, it's a bit of a conversion evolution process. And as you guys know, as founders and having talked to founders, these things are more of a primordial soup where uh, concepts emerge. So I was a partner at Expa uh, and over the years there, we build and uh, fund companies. And what I'd seen is that over and over again, when you're starting out, especially in that early stage, first time founders want to know how to incorporate. They want to know how to set up their accounting. A lot of the things that if you're experienced, <clears throat> you've done, you may have a network, but it presents stress. And the observation that I had is if you're a venture backed founder, you actually have a lot of resources to help solve that issue, right? But if you're an SMB and you're a venture backed, you don't have those, those resources. So how I started thinking about how you could democratize that. How can you use the internet um, and the, as a channel to empower them with the same types of tools and insights. So that's kind of the starting. And um, <clears throat> we actually had a project that we, I kind of codenamed startup.com. I tried to actually buy that uh, domain. <laughs> but unfortunately, Microsoft owns it. So uh, good luck with that. Um, and that, that's, I started exploring how we would go about that. And um, Basically, when I started going through that experimentation, this process of conversion evolution started where I met my co-founders, two Turkish immigrants. One had immigrated, uh, you know, more recently. Uh, and uh, Ooh, who I'd met first, and my co-founder is from Turkey. He was a freelancer. And so he actually came in and pitched a very similar concept to me. And I, I stopped him and I said, look, this is going to be the best meaning of your life or the worst meaning of your life because I want I'm doing the same thing. So he said, all right, let's talk. Let's see how we can do it together. Um, and we jammed for a couple of weeks back and forth to see if we, we, we saw the world the same way, same values, ultimately decided to, to co-found and work on this company together um, under the Expo umbrella. And so that's how we got started. And uh, over, over a couple of months, we basically came to uh, a couple of simple conclusions. One, we shared the same vision, which was simple. We want to help this population, a business of one, be more successful. And the way we want to do that is by helping them focus on their passion and not their paperwork. All this stuff is necessary, right? When you think about um, accounting, tax, compliance, I mean, they're really important things, but you're not going to make your business, right? It's not like you're going to be the best business in the world because you have the best accounting, right? It's because the founders are out there hustling, creating revenue, generating value, right? So we look at ourselves almost like if you were a superhero combo, we're Robin, you know, the founder is Batman. And the, the simple, you know, kind of go to market that we wanted to have around that was, okay, why don't we design a back office, just be an all in one platform, we'll handle the formation, we'll handle the accounting, we'll handle the personal business taxes, we'll handle all of the compliance. So um, I would say simplified way of thinking about it is the turbocharged accountant you wish you had, right? Because otherwise, and Arjun, you know this well, um, you'd have to go incorporate in one air with one person, then you'd have to go and have to buy QuickBooks, then you'd have to set up uh, your payroll with Gusto and, and, and it, just, it just goes on. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty deep list. And even if that list isn't daunting to you, creating an integrated approach where you can manage all of those tools is actually um, pretty, pretty tough. Um, and uh, so, so that's how the idea came about. And I'd say the insight that really drove us and you, know, you mentioned the growth was uh, with, with people that we work with are knowledge workers. They're, they're really dedicated to their, their craft. We found that if you're making a certain amount of income for your business, call it like, you know, $65,000, $70,000 or more, 
all things being equal, you should be formed as a, a, a tax elected in S corp. And most of them weren't. And so you can save thousands and thousands of dollars. And now we've run the business for a while. We're saving people, you know, $9,000 a year. So if you think about it, you have to do this stuff anyway. It's meat and potatoes part of business. You pay us $200 a month. We save you $9,000. It's a really, really win-win for everyone. We're making money. You're saving money. The founders are focusing on what they want to. Of course, we have a long way to go, right? I mean, Arjun uh, knows a lot about our internal process. has been kind enough to be uh, working with us and, and helping us. So he knows uh, we have a lot of work to do. But the vision, I think, I'm, we're very committed to. And we think that's the direction where the world's going to go. Yeah, really well said. I was, I was just going to have you like kind of unpack a few of the trends you're seeing in the marketplace and kind of in your customer base, because I agree that there's significant savings using collective, but it's not just, you know, financial, right? Because it's also the psychological thing. It's the peace of mind. It's the knowing that if you do need to present it, you don't have to spend a whole day, like finding your logins to different platforms. <laughs> and well, so, and that's where we want to go. That's, right. I, I think you got it. And um, John, honestly, it's funny. You should be on a marketing team. Like the peace of mind piece is, is huge. Um, I used to uh, tell people, explain, they said, what are you selling? I said, well, we have the service, but ultimately where we want to go and what we're doing is peace of mind that pays, right? So if I can come to you and say, hey, listen, we're, think of the brand collective, right? We, we are a collective for you, but then also hopefully we can create, we can do things together as a community. Um, and I'll, I can talk a little bit more about the future of the company as a group that we couldn't do as individuals. And so, I mean, that's really what we're trying to deliver. So imagine before you're like, oh, I'm on Google. Do I incorporate, am I LLC? Am I an S corp? Oh wait, I need an EIN if I want to be this. I need a business bank. I mean, and you're doubting yourself and you're calling that one friend that you have. They're getting annoyed because you keep calling them about it. And so what if we can just be that concierge that you can hit up, message them? Is this right? Is this wrong? And, and that peace of mind is huge when you're by yourself. Being a founder is hard enough. Being a founder by yourself forever, by definition, um, we, we just, that's, that's really challenging. So uh, as I said, we were, our aspiration is to create that environment where we're a good sounding, where we're consistent. It's hard, right? Because we're scaling very quickly and we have to automate quite a bit because we, we're serving you know, so many people. But um, we're pretty committed to that. And um, hopefully we can, we can make people more money. I mean, why should you only rich people get the tax savings? To be honest with you, it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, if you think about capital gains, for example, right? You know, people who are investing in startups, you hold that stock with QSPS for five years and you pay like nothing. You pay like no taxes because you're doing capital gains. And I mean, if I was on the East Coast, I didn't pay, you don't pay anything when, if you hold a stock for five years. And so, um, when you're making just a normal amount of money, you know, uh, and you don't get that kind of benefit. So it's, it's kind of, it's, it's nice. It, it feels good to, to fight for, for like the, the, the majority of founders in the country, right? Like my parents who were, who were had their own office. Yeah. You're so right. Like it's like progressive tax and all that. And like actually introduces frictions for people who actually want upward mobility, but people who are already upwardly mobile, like, <laughs> Well, it's not an issue. They got all these other options, right? It's yeah. I mean, if you're if you're an uh, angel investor in a startup and you hold the stock for five years, your effective tax rate is lower than that of probably like a police officer or a nurse on income that you're making that could be seven figures plus. I mean, it's yeah. just it's not fair. So, but if we can, you know, like the S corp is 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 one mechanism. You know, we had people who were saying twelve thousand dollars. We have people who are saying twenty thousand dollars, right? And so. Uh, if you take that savings, this is just structural, not even just by normal accounting stuff where we're like, you should uh, itemize this expense and all of that. So, and then we say, we're trying to save the time. So I think the case is, how do we supercharge these founders at the end of the day? Because yeah. they are founders. They're not uh, just a doctor or a realtor or an investor or an advisor. They're founders. They're founders. They just won't get access to the venture ecosystem because they're not venture founders. Yeah, wow. so well said. And, you know, what have you seen in your growing user base? Because, you know, I remember the passion economy kind of became, an, was an, more of an idea like 10 years ago. And then people who are wild enough to pursue it, learn the internet, they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, right? Fast forward now, you could be, you could be like a really good business. You could run a really good business with a YouTube channel, right? Or you could use free tools on Instagram, create a studios, right? And you're in business, whether you're in college or not. 
And so there's this like, what do you see in terms of this rising creator economy that's, I would say, becoming professionalized and arguably is a much bigger market than people immediately perceive, right? Um, do, do, you, do you have an insight around that or what do you see on the ground having, you know, work uh, on building collective and serving your customers for a few years now? So a lot of our customers, we call them creators and builders, right? So we have <clears throat> uh, people who are growth hacking consultants, we have data scientists, we have software developers, uh, we have photographers, videographers. And so they're creatives. Some of them are in your definition creators, like they're um, monetizing those creations through social, Instagram, whatever. And I would say like we're seeing uh, a pretty rapid pickup in that marketplace. And so we have people, we have like top writers on Substack who are working with us. We have top influencers who are working with us um, now because, I mean, and I'll even go further. I mean, it, it, this may be like a loaded uh, thing to say, but like you have people like on OnlyFans, right? They're making a lot of money. And so who's going to serve them? And it's, it's to me, you know, there's all these ways to create content. And uh, I think that's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So actually it's a perfect fit for a collective uh, because they're, in our definition, knowledge workers. They're providing a service and we have an online virtual service so that they can just do what they do, focus on what they uh, are, are great at. And, and we're just in the background, again, using that Batman and Robin analogy, right? Just making sure that we take care of the finances so that they can be in the front, whether they're on Instagram, whether they're on Substack and what have you. But I've been pretty stunned to see some of the income of some of these people. Like we have one woman who went from like a hundred to uh, seven figures, uh, we have Substack writers who are, are getting up to seven figures, um, so hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and, uh, you know, they're not like Kim Kardashian or something like that, where they have, they need 100 million followers. I mean, this can be a lifestyle because the internet's just so big now. And so I do think the creator economy is going to be pretty large. That said, I will, I'll, I'll say something, maybe it's contrarian. I think much like when the gig economy popped up, the venture community is probably over-indexing the creator economy over-indexing the gig economy and underestimating what already exists. Like there's millions of physicians, there's millions of retail or uh, uh, realtors. Like there's all these perfect contractors, plumbers. They're so much bigger than this population and they're growing. And so I, I do think it's funny that uh, people are like flooding towards this creator economy. I think cause it's, it's quote unquote new um, and we love it. I mean, again, these customers for us are their ideal members for our business, the way that they work, they're online, they're virtual, they're tech savvy. Um, they don't want to go to an accountant. They don't want to go to a lawyer. They just want someone to handle it and they want it to be online. So we love those types of, of members. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks for sharing all that, um, uh, Human. We've we spent a good amount of time uh, exploring Collective and its potential, but want to talk a bit about you, right? Because, um, you know, uh, you know, you, you're a founder, a serial founder by background, I think. Um, but what drives you, you know, what drives you to build collective and what drives you to stay in kind of the venture game? It's a good question. I, I think it's one that I ask myself a lot. And Arjun and I actually took a number of walks uh, when we were allowed to be in an office, uh, when we were, you know, at the Expo yeah. office. Arjun uh, was, was a valuable advisor, not just to Expo, but to me on, on this journey. Um, you know, ultimately, I, I, I really just enjoy being around builders and being a builder, right? And so whether it's angel investing or when, when I was investing at the Expa, leading, you know, the seed program, it, it, to me, it's all flavors of the same thing, which is you're helping people who are creative uh, impact the world. And business is an amazing vehicle, right? Especially when you come up as an engineer. So you could build, you know, software and you can build a program and you only have limited aperture of denting, you know, the universe. It's getting wider as, as just when you're coding. But if you can build a company, I mean, think about the power of what Steve Jobs did, right? He created something beyond himself. And yes, of course, they ushered in the era of personal computing. And you can look at the actual products themselves and say, wow, look what they did. But the bigger invention was Apple. It's an engine of innovation that exists beyond him, that continues to impact the world beyond him, that is now has like hundreds of billions of dollars of cash and trillions of dollars of value. That's like, to me, as an, as an engineer, as a technologist, that ultimate invention, but it's different than building product because it's organic, right? So you, it gets sick, it gets hurt. 
it, it, it falls, you know, so it's much more, I would say, akin to rearing a child, which Arjun, I think you, you're more of an expert at this than me, but than it is to building a, a product. There are, there are some analogs. And so I just enjoy that process of being with the creative people who want to impact change. And I think startups are, are one of the best tools uh, to do so. Thanks. Well, thanks. And, and did you have the bug kind of when you were five, when you first learned to like read, write <laughs> and, and speak, uh, or was there a catalyst for you um, at some stage in your early years? You know, I was, I think about this a lot. And I think it's, it's one of these things that when you look back in hindsight, it becomes obvious, like the line because it's chaos, right? They, they often you hear that when you're in this situation, it feels very um, Brownian motion, you know, chaos. But when you look back, you can kind of see this path to where you are and it makes sense. And if I was to look at it from that lens of looking backwards, you know, I'd always been into like, I would say what's now like common culture, but when I was younger, like Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy and sci-fi and this like, you know, there was a, a imagination and a creativity that I like, just enjoyed this like world. And I remember when computers first came out and video games, like we, we were lucky, like my generation, we were, we were offline and then online. We, we remember both very well, right? And I think that characterizes the entrepreneurs who are my age. And I remember that feeling. I mean, I don't know if you guys do, but like you get this computer and it like, you could, I, I'd paint and I could like make something and just, it was cool. And then I remember coding my first program. It was my first huge program was one I remember really vividly. It was a character generator for Dungeons and Dragons. So if you guys ever played that game, it's so annoying to build characters because you had to like get a piece of paper, write up the, the sheet, roll the dice. Like it was, it could be hours to, to get that generated and I could do it. And it was just fascinating to me that like you could have that happen. And I think that's when I started seeing the power of almost like it's, it's a form of magic, right? Like you can, you can create like something from nothing and that's what like software did. So that's where I started getting into that. But I mean, I was in Pittsburgh, my parents are immigrants. They don't understand the industry. I didn't really understand <clears throat> startups or entrepreneurship was like a path. It was, it was, it was like be a doctor, be a lawyer. It was, so I started getting into that, my interest. And then when I went to Penn, um, there was a talk uh, Josh Koppelman, who founded First Round, was still an entrepreneur at the time, and he was an alum. And he had just sold a company called Half.com to eBay. And um, Andy Ratcliffe, who was an alum, had founded Benchmark. Okay, and I think they had just invested in eBay or, or something like that. And so, my, I, but both of them were giving a talk on entrepreneurship. It was during the dot com. It was like right when it was like really crazy. And I sat in the audience, and I'll never forget because my friend, who's also an entrepreneur now, we were sitting next to each other. And I'm watching these guys. I'm like, Josh Kaufman is a very youthful face, right? He looks very young at, to begin with. And at the time he was young. And I'm like, that guy started a company? That guy took something public. And Andy Reckless talking about how you get venture capital. And it, and it was like clicked. It just like clicked that that was the confluence. It wasn't just building software. It was like, you're allowed to do this whole creative uh, path that I never understood. And so it just, it, it was a door that once that opened, I was like, I got to do that. And then I just tried to figure out how do I get to that? That was like the remaining of the, uh, of the journey. So that, that was it. Well, let's carry on. Like, how did you get to that? Right. You knew you wanted to get to that, but was it what was so, really like getting there? I mean, totally, totally bumpy and shitty. <laughs> um, so uh, I had this idea and it's always funny telling the story now because you either think you're like a visionary or an idiot, but um, I'm super into movies. Like I'm a huge movie buff. Like I can tell you what actors are in what movies. I've watched thousands of movies. I just love it. And so at the time, this is dating myself, Blockbuster was the place you go to get movies, right? <clears throat> I hated that place. They would always charge me on late fees because I was just, you know, inconsistent taking movies back. And I remember I went in I had like $80 of ladies for me. That was a ton of money at the time. And I just flipped. Uh, I was like flipping it. I was, cause I was like, we're used to remember when you were in the dorm rooms and you could stream movies and it was Napster and people were kind of pirating and whatnot. <clears throat> and I'm like, you know what? One day I'm not going to even have to come in here anymore. This is BS. Like you're not even going to, I was, my girlfriend at the time probably remembers. I was like, your, your company's not even going to exist. You're not going to have a job, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I'm 20. I was being a jerk. But I was like, all right, I'm going to build a system. So me and my friend, Matt, 
this, I, I told him, let's build like a streaming video company. And again, we, we didn't know what that meant. Were we like a backend provider? Were we a consumer? I mean, it, we were so young, but we knew that that was the future. So we started building this out. And then there's a professor who said, oh, well, companies are getting funded. I'll be an advisor and all this stuff. So we're like, okay, we're, gonna, we're starting a company. So we're writing a business plan. And I read this paper that Bell Atlantic put out on uh, Stargazer, which was like in 1993, delivering high-speed video over uh, ADSL, which was like the new delivery technology at the time. I'm like, okay, we'll do that. Like we'll deliver movies. We'll charge like, I don't remember, like $3.99 per movie. We'll do deals with it. Like that was the vision. I wrote this plan. And so we started building it out. And then the dot-com just like, like, it, you know, I don't know if you guys remember, it was like a couple of weeks and it was just like gone. Everything was gone. And my professor told me, well, you know, you're not, you gotta, you're, you're not going to be able to probably get a job. You're definitely not, this company thing is not going to work out. You should go to grad school. And so, uh, so that's, that was it. And, but I had a good senior project and I, so I went to grad school to study networking at Carnegie Mellon because I wanted to continue with this because I was really passionate oh, interesting, about it. Interesting. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I'll just do that. And it, when I was at Carnegie Mellon, I picked up a paper that, you know, networking has a lot of graph theory, which I think now is more popular because Facebook popular is this concept of graphs. And I, I still can't remember how I found it, but I read a paper on using graphs to represent social relationships and Friendster had just come out and um, I believe it was Orkut and LinkedIn. So it was like 2002 to 2004 period. And um, I was like, oh, this is super cool. And this is way cooler than like packet optimization and uh, multicast protocols and all that. I kind of was, was over that. And so I got, I got that, I got stuck on that. So I did my master's thesis around how you use these graphs, you know, for, to represent relationships and whatnot. And then my co-founder for my first company was my office mate. And his, his point of view was the web was basically, I mean, you guys remember, it's just like a magazine. And he wanted to basically, he said, look, it should be a programming platform, but that was open question there. There's no rest. Right. So it's like, What's the API? What are the API standards? Is it going to be like WSDL, XML, RPC? What are we going to do for security? I mean, there's a whole research corpus that had to be created before that happened. And so um, we combined kind of our points of view. Both of us kind of felt uh, excited about the internet, but we also felt cheated that we missed it. And so we started a company after grad school. And to be honest, we, we had some concepts um, there, but it was, it was like very old school, like consulting, bootstrappy, grinded out mac and cheese kind of stuff uh, because it was post.com right it wasn't an elegant time so we messed around for a year or two until we arrived at the concept for the first company yeah and then eventually you found yourself as a partner at expo yeah yeah uh after so the first company was in the marketing automation space which is actually how arjun and i met yeah. um I, I think you were at retargeter mm -hmm. and uh i met you at a dinner in fact i believe and so yeah. Uh, I was, I was kind of, it's interesting. You, you don't know when you're a first time entrepreneur, in particular, when you're that early in your career, you don't really understand the landscape you're participating in. Uh, little did I know when I was starting what became ad this, that I was building a marketing automation company. I thought I was building a developer tools company. Mm -hmm. turns out the developers were trying to drive traffic and engagement on behalf of the marketers. And so that's what I ended up learning, which is a great place to, um, to play when you're early in your career. Cause market, you know, the marketing and ad tech stack was the majority of driving you know, revenue, you either make money on ads or you're selling something pretty much on the internet, e-commerce or subscriptions. Subscriptions and SaaS was very, very early. Still early yeah. um, and e-commerce I would say was nascent. Um, so advertising was like the cool monetization at that time. So it was good to be in that industry. Um, but the benefit of what we were doing, because we basically, we built tools, we had a freemium model. So we gave out free plugins to increase your traffic engagement. We built the first social sharing, first viral analytics, first kind of follow tools, all these types of things. And I got to meet all the people who are starting social networks, which who knew? I picked the wrong stuff, right? Arjun, we should have done that. Uh, that was a better, better run. Ooh, like, right. <laughs> like Ev was doing Twitter. And so it was yep. like seven people. You know, we would walk in the Facebook offices on university. Um, and it was like, you know, it was a hundred of them right? It was just a different game. Mm -hmm. um, and so Garrett, who's my partner at Expa, had found a stumble upon, he, so, which was one of the people in the competitive mix at that time. And that's how I met him. And Roberto actually was working at stumble upon as well. And uh, so when I decided to move from the East Coast out to the West Coast, I called Garrett, I called a bunch of the people in the social space, because I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. 
And um, that's how I got connected with Expo. He was, he, he had started Uber and I think he decided, uh, hey, I, I wanna keep doing that phase. I wanna start the Ubers or fund the Ubers and help build that from the ground in the earliest phase and add value there based on my experience. And so that was the, the genesis, I think, of the Expo concept. And you know, I didn't know how long it was gonna be there to be honest, right? Like I, I was like, oh, I'll hang out here for a year or two. It was, who knew, six years, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I think yeah. at, at Expa yeah. and also, you know, just beyond Expa, you have worked with so many startups. You've invested in them at the earliest stages and at, at many later stages as well and, and advise companies through, you know, so many challenging moments. As you look back at your support of startups, maybe what are some of the big things that you've learned in how you were able to be most supportive to the companies that you either invested in or advised? And what, how did that relationship unfold or what were those conversations or what were those moments where you as someone who was sitting from the outside was able to have you know, marked impact on, on the business? So I think uh, you know, I learned from, I was lucky because some of my investors and advisors and mentors provided the model. And uh, I had a couple of them in particular um, so there's one gentleman, Bobby Yasini, who's one of the first investors in my company um, for a Persian guy, he early exec at Oracle. Like I think he was in the hundreds of employees, right? Like one of those mafia guys. He didn't, he was one of the first investors in Salesforce and Google. Like he's like OG. Um, Ted Leonsis, who had founded, co-founded AOL and then Nigel Morris co-founded Capital One. And these were people that were, uh, I was lucky to get around me in my first company. I learned a lot. I'm still learning a lot from the things they said before because you can't digest all of it at that time. And I think some perspectives that I got that were super helpful was first and foremost, like have a very long view on your relationship. And it's, it's, it's not intuitive, right? So I think people get very transactional when they're investing and advising. But if you look at the person as like, okay, we're going to have a relationship for a long period of time. This may be the company. This may not be the company, but I'm investing in you and your success. You, t- you have a more tempered view. You, and and they and then there's a humanity that gets injected into the relationship that sometimes gets missed when you have a pure lens of that transactional investment, right? So, uh, and that that not only pays off in the way you treat the founder at that time, but also it can it can have a very broad reaching impact. So, like a crazy example of it um, is uh, so I took that perspective and I worked with a friend of mine, uh, Fahad Hassan, who's now an expo founder. He had started a company on the East Coast. Um, we were, you know, friends on the East Coast. And then I invested in his first company and I was on his board. And uh, when that journey kind of, I took a, you know, I had that long view perspective with him. I always would tell him about that. And I think some investors, so when he, he had uh, exited that company. You know, it was, it was a tough road. He finally got I mean, exited. It was, it was not like, a, it was not an up into the right case. It was a grind case. He was, he was pretty tired. And I think a lot of, you know, people, uh, he probably felt like, I don't know what to do next. Do I, you know, very classic founder thing. <clears throat> and um, I, I didn't just invested in Convoy. And I was like, dude, you got to talk to Dan. It was nothing. It was like two or three people, right? I think it was called Graypoint at the time. Um, this is before Reed invested and Greylock and everyone else. And I was like, dude, you know what? Like you need to experience a startup with wind at your back. Cause you've had one with wind in your face for four years. And if you just understand like that, I think you're going to learn a ton. And I think you could be a huge value because he's, I think he founded like three, four companies. I mean, it's not like he was a rookie, but he hadn't had that like crazy experience. And so he went over and worked at Convoy, which, and I think the combo of him and Dan and Grant was explosive. I mean, the company started, was growing like crazy. Um, And so that long view really helped, right? That you, you stayed in with the person, you helped them out, had a relationship, but I was that that view and that relationship with him helped me help Convoy, right? And help both of them together. So I, I just kind of view it as an ecosystem and like a, you're just trying to cultivate and help people move forward. And the company is just like a, a cup. The water though, that you actually need is the people, right? That's what, that, that's how you survive, you know? And so if you take that view, I feel like, you know, you'll be a good position. Yeah, that's great. And clearly that thinking um, and that philosophy is is folding into what you're doing at Collective and helping the founders that you work with. So that's great to see how that that all ties together so cleanly. And hopefully that gives them empathy too. I mean, look, at the end of the day, I think what I learned about investors and, and you guys get this too, they're just human beings, right? Like all of us are just 
trying to be actualized, trying to live good lives, have families, and then, you know, of course be successful, but ultimately just be happy, right? And so if you take it the view of that person is just trying to be happy and do the right thing, even when they're making a mistake and vice versa, again, inject humanity into the relationship. I think when there is tension between founders and investors the most is when investors assume that because they're the providers of capital that they have all the answers. I, I try my best to provide advice and frameworks and uh, versus you know dogmatic, like you should do X. I'm like, oh, well, I've seen situations like this. Here's how I would make the decision. Here's a framework for you because assumptions can be very dangerous in a very an exponentially growing environment. Like things that worked for you ten years ago may not work again. You know that's so well said. The um, you know, hundred percent. I think, I think at the end of the day, you gotta remember that I think as a, as founders raise, it can be and build relationships with investors. You know, it can be a mind numbing process, right? Um, but at the end of the day, like you can't move them without empathy for like what's important to them and try to bridge the gap. But, you know, in your experience, because you just recently raised, um, was it your series A or series B? It's actually, it was a C. <laughs> it was a C? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it was yeah. like a, it's down the road, right? Like it's, you know. It was a pretty big C. Yeah, it's not, you're not, you're not, you're raising from institutional funds, whereas from the seed or pre-seed, you could get like very notary super angels or like early stage um, emerging manager funds where that bond between founder and investor is exactly as you stipulated, a long-term investment. But when you're moving a group of decision makers um, who have a certain perspective about your market and what you should build, what have you observed to be the difference that makes a difference to educate those stakeholders on your market? Because one thing we see is that more often than not, no one really sizes a market better than the entrepreneur on the ground. <laughs> We haven't seen too many uh, investors get that insight, but um, di did you did you experience differences there? Was it like solid agreement, or was there an education process that had to happen? So uh, we were lucky uh, for our investors. So I am a, I have learned, and maybe you know this will be the bias that hurts me, but my bias is towards uh, working with people that I have an existing relationship with, or I feel like I can develop one with, because ultimately you're not going to be hitting home runs all day, right? If you're the best baseball player in the world, you're hitting one out of three. Okay. And uh, the best venture capitalist in the world is hitting one out of 10. Right. And so as an entrepreneur, why should you be subject to like, or, or sorry, why, why do you expect that you're going to do so much better? Uh, and so the trick is actually just not to run out of cash so you have more shots on goal and keep things moving and, and just be a really, really good, good better, right? And I wanted to have relationships with people where I could say, look, here's what I know. Here's what I don't know. Let's work together. And, you know, I'm going to take the risk. It's my job to make those bets. But why don't you tell me factually what you believe? And if I'm not doing a good job or you don't agree, let me know. I'll make the bet at the end of the day. So you have to have a for me to be successful, I wanted a partner or partners that could tell me how it is in a way that was very data-driven, but then ultimately uh, disagree and commit if, if, if we were in that, so inclined. Because you, well, the worst thing to have, I think, when you have investors is, you know, drag along investors where like they're doing it because you're, they're, the right thing to do is to back the CEO, but they ultimately don't really like firmly back your direction. It's like having a management team that is like, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna go left. And then they're all like, ah, oh, we're going right. Man, I told you we should have gone right, right? It's very, very hard for the CEO. Um, so creating that dynamic ultimately requires a relationship. And so that's why, you know, general catalyst in QD. I've known QD, uh, so Nigel, the founder, was founder of Capital One. He was one of my first investors. I think he invested before QD was started. And then we filled into the QD firm as a result, or, or, or some very early, I mean, it was like so early. Their first CEO, uh, I think, event was like seven of us, eight of us. Um, and then at, at General Catalyst, I've known Nico for, you know, since since I moved here, I mean, even before, because he's friends with my younger brother, uh, Cyrus, and we were, that's how we met. And so we, we built a relationship. We've done deals together. So for me, it's like, okay, I see how they work. I see how they carry themselves. I see their integrity. And then that's how we, that's how you do it. Because ultimately, and then you have to see where they land in their firm, right? So if they're senior in their firm, 
you know, I tell entrepreneurs all the time, you really have to assess the partner in the firm, right? Because ultimately, look, it's great to get a young partner who's like fresh out, you get a good perspective, but you're taking a bet because in two years, if they're not showing up and the, the older GPs think that they're not the right fit for whatever reason, you're going to get the, the, you sold your seat to the firm, not to the partner. So you, you're probably going to get someone new. And so you should then assess the firm. Like, do you agree with the culture? Is this young gun partner an outlier, you know, whatever. So um, that's what, again, where, why relationships are so important. You can talk to them about that. Where are you? Are you, are, and make sure that they're going to, you want this instability at the top with your investors trickles down to the, to the firm and vice versa, by the way, if there's stability that can bolster you as a CEO. Yeah, super well said. Wow, I can't wait to get what you just said out to founders. As a perspective, right? As you said, you know, there might be a personal bias, but it's also another way, uh, it's also another meta model or an approach to consider, right? Because the more you have, you can't go wrong because you have more flexibility and choice. I, I, I do think now with the market being as hot as it is, um, look, there's a saying, in, a Persian saying, what comes with the wind goes with the wind. Right. So if somebody comes in and says they're going to preempt and you don't have a relationship and you're really hot right now, great. If you're not hot, let's see where they are when you're not hot. Right. And so the relationship is critical. I'm not suggesting that you can't build a relationship quickly and that you can't make those calls quickly. I just think you should, you know, if you're optimizing for the transaction, you will get what you pay for. Right. And you have to be very, very careful yeah. about that. Uh, it bites both ways. Um, and so that's why like, the, I tell my co-founders and my team, make the mistake on the relationship, make the mistake on something that, that's firm or ground because, you know, the economy is up into the right right now. Sorry, the stock market is up into the right right now. Um, and so consequently ventures up into the right. You know, we've all been through, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been through two, you know, downs and you want to have people in your corner that when you're, you're down are, are going to, you know, be responsive. Again, you have to be doing a good job too, but... Um, it's tough. It's tough when you have a bunch of transactional people all piling onto the hottest thing. If you're not the hottest thing, you know, who knows, who knows the if they're going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, well, so well said, you know, and, um, you know, obviously, you know, there's, there's a handful of high potential founders onto great things that maybe haven't played your playbook in terms of relationships or just haven't had the time on the block to actually solidify and really get to understand some of um, the people that they could potentially be partnering with kind of, you know, from your point of view, right. When you're assessing a relationship, what things are you looking for? What signals are you looking for to let you know, Hey, you know, when things get tough, this guy rises to the challenge for me or things that, you know, you, that can't easily, or maybe you have an opinion that they can be easily uh, uh, elicited from back channel or like reference calls, but, um, if someone's in a position where they don't have the luxury of time, what sort of questions should they be asking them? So, I mean, look, even with my existing investors that I knew, uh, I still did reference calls. And um, just to reinforce my point of view, because you have inherent bias, right? If you want to get a deal done as an entrepreneur, you can create the narrative that rationalizes your bias. And um, so when I called, I, I mean, I'll give you some questions that I asked. I think the most salient piece of information is, okay, tell me a time when you were low or that you had a transition, what did they do for you then? And how were they then? Or you ask founders that failed, quote unquote, right? Like, so the business doesn't do well. Cause you can go to people up into the right and ask how the uh, investor is then. Everyone's cool, man. I mean, for the most part, if you're bad then, so that's, that's a huge signal. If you hear someone's trouble when it's up into the right run, right, then you want right. to, uh, you know, that's, that's an easy one. That's, yeah. that's short circuit evaluation. That's a really simple decision tree. <laughs> simple decision, right? Because they're not going to be fun when it's going down. Um, but I think entrepreneurs should try to find the portfolio companies that didn't go well, that didn't realize their potential or that are just okay. In my opinion, actually, you know, there's companies, you, you hear about the breakouts. You may even hear about the people that don't make it because both are um, canonized, almost like, oh, you hear about the company that raised 50 million and didn't do well. And you hear about the company that raised 500 million and is killing right. it. There's a skew in PR attention, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But talking to the people that are, that didn't have a group, that ended poorly, 
but is good. Um, or, but even the middle, like, Hey, you've been going for, this is the ones that VCs hate. It's like eight years, nine years in it's growing, but not really. Um, it's not hot enough to attract top tier managers. Um, it's not quite in the strike zone of M and a can't quite go public. You know, it's just like, just, and there's a lot of these like that just, they're good companies. They're solid, but the venture curve pushes them. If they're not like hockey sticking, then all things being equal, if you're a venture partner, you have N board seats that you can right. take. And now one of your seats is taken by something that's not going to be a phenomenal exit. So you're taking bandwidth away from that. Yeah. So and it becomes become a weight. Kind of forgotten children. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. talking to both, the, maybe that's what I would do. I just try to talk to people who are in the middle and at the bottom. The top is interesting, but like not instructive. Because that's where you see someone's character. It's, 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 um, and, and their perseverance. You see how they really are. Because it's very hard for a VC to rationalize putting time to something that's nose down or a founder that's nose down. I understand. Man, I, I think if we just recorded what you said in the last five minutes, we could sell it on Udemy for like $59. The, I, I think love every, it. <laughs> but the, uh, no, I think it's worth like, it's worth its weight in gold, especially when, you know, like you said, one of the things that you said that really struck a chord was, you know, when someone's wanting to invest meaningful capital, institutional capital, and and you kind of like it, it's attractive. It's like you've hit a new milestone in your career and business. It is so easy to start to construct a narrative that just says, yes, 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 versus, hey, is this actually within my interest? What questions should I be asking? Because this is someone I'm likely going to have to live with forever or they're going to have to live with me. Yeah. Uh, like I, I could tell you like things that are not intuitive too as a founder. I mean, because especially if you're a first time founder in a market, you have a confirmation bias. So each round is high. Let's say two round, rounds in a row are higher. You assume the third round will be better. So you, you're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to optimize over optimize on valuation and firm name. Right. <clears throat> and then the next round isn't higher or the next round is flat or the next round is whatever or you hit a, a rut. Now you're left with this, the big firm that you wanted. Okay, well, again, let's say that you have the luminary at the firm, right? It's almost the worst because if you were to get, um, you know, like one of those uh, like very famous, for, let's, let's pick one. Like if you had like uh, uh, Reed Hoffman at Greylock or someone like that, right? Amazing guy, reputationally smart, but like, think about it. Personally a billionaire, running one of the better firms in Silicon Valley on something that's flat to nose down and he's super busy. So he'll start, I mean, his incentive structure, and again, I don't work with him. I mean, he, hopefully he wouldn't do this, but his incentive structure isn't aligned with you as a founder to sit there and like dig in the ditch. If you're like optimal outcome is a hundred million dollar exit because it's, you know, for his firm. So, you know, you have to be very careful in constructing your risk, you know, along the way, right? And so it, it's interesting. I mean, you, just, you never know, but I think sometimes people don't think through that. It's okay, you could say, hey, look, I think I'm gonna be up in the right. I'm gonna get, like Convoy got Reed to come in. He's been fantastic. It's gonna be, you know, God knows, $10 billion company. It was a bet, but you have to consciously make those decisions. Yeah, you don't just do it because it's like the right, the quote unquote right thing to do. Cause you, you have to think on the down. If you hit any bumps, right? Like, whereas like, if you got a, a strong, like a GP who is maybe, okay, not, not quite as um, luminary and like has a long track record, it's gotten beat up, but you have a long relationship. Hey, if you hit a bump then there, and you have to just assess where you are and say like, okay, where am I? What, what do I want to bet on right now?